So now we're going to look, and I'm going to go really quick because here what I'm doing is basically uh, borrowing from some of the empirical work done by the Center for Global Development and the Global Education Monitoring Report to give you a little sense of the way in which current international uh, development assistance is delivered. And remember, ODA, it's really the aid provided by donors who are members of the Development is Assistance Committee of the OECD. That is a used to be a smaller club. It's now quite a big club. It includes many middle income countries. But we're not, I'm not going to focus specifically on non governmental actors here, more on this official development assistance, the efficient the assistance from one country to another country, or because ODA includes flows to multilaterals, the multilateral aid um, provided through ODA. Um, so uh, I wanted to say to start by saying that, you know, we have um, seen we, you know, we can be kind of pessimistic on in the sense that perhaps the global goals all never were met in any period, we set these global goals, and we don't achieve them. But some global goals really um, seem to have underpinned uh, vast changes. And in particular, um, improvement in primary education access is has been quite remarkable. And I think in a lecture you had from Lant, he would have shared um, a nice graph showing you that this ex expansion of primary education is gone at a faster pace in the last 50 years than it went in hundreds of years, or, or even in individual Western countries. So very fast, but still um, we really see these gaps. So in particular, when you look at the completion rate at secondary level, it's um, very, very much less than what uh, we expected when we set these global goals in 2015. And uh, I think this, this diagram, which I, I, we only have brought up to 2016, I haven't updated it, but I, to me, but the picture hasn't changed. In fact, it's probably um, it become worse. And what you can really see here is this really big leap forward between 2000 and 2008, and then a flattening of um, the number of out of school children. So really this, the rates of out of school children became has is a really stubborn a stubborn problem and it's one that we haven't um, addressed and that probably after COVID is a little bit worse. This is projection from um, this beautiful Our World in Data uh, website and it's the number of people aged 15 plus with no education. Again, um, you can see this drop, very very sharp drop. But when you look geographically, that you see at the bottom this very worrying. Uh, flattening, um, almost no drop at all uh, from countries uh, overall in children without education, adults, people without education in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and then uh, more recent data from the World Bank that's increasingly uh, a source of evidence on the number of kids who who are in school, but they don't learn. So here um, showing that for every 100 children in low and middle income countries, uh, uh, 53 children were in learning poverty. That is, they didn't meet minimum standards at age 10, uh, so, so more than half. <laughs> and um, uh, only 37 in every 100 children were actually learning, achieving the, the right to education. Um, I want to talk a little bit about total numbers that education's share in public expenditure still grows domestically. Uh, it's very uneven, of course, the many, many countries, um, about a third of those uh, captured in the GEM data, uh, miss uh, both two benchmarks for domestic financing, that, that of spending 4% of GDP and 50% of national spending on education. And aid to education has remained pretty flat, pretty stagnant. Um, we only have the numbers up to the end of 2019 because um, the data collected by OECD is always lagged by, by one or even two years. Uh, and one thing to point out that I'll show you in a graph shortly is that what originally I talked about 
improving the use of national systems through budget support for aid, and it fell in education from 6.6% uh, .6 to 2.5%. So that, that era of using national systems to deliver aid itself has declined. Well, this is just so you can see um, this, this interesting um, feature of the aid, aid uh, architecture that health itself was a much bigger beneficiary for the MDG period uh, than education was. It, its uh, volume of aid grew enormously. It, it uh, education aid had a little bump up, and then of course it uh, remained reasonably fat, flat. And you can see that this effort to use general budget support was not a big success. Um, here, I just wanted to highlight the fact that health turns out to be easier to deliver. Um, in a multilateral form than education. And that is a puzzle, but a puzzle that I think links back to education's role in um, uh, geopolitical interests of governments. Uh, governments really, especially by focusing on higher education, still to this day, uh, gain quite a lot in terms of their geopolitical um, self-interest that they can't gain through multilateral means. Um, one of the things that the aid regime has been characterized most recently is a pull of funding out of Africa and basic education to Africa, which we saw is the continent that um, has the highest overall numbers of out of school children. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not quite true. Has will will over time continue to have the the most entrenched problem with out of school and um, uh, low learning levels. Um, I think South Asia is actually improving, still improving pretty rapidly, but the funding is now really focused on uh, kids in conflict settings. And I'm not going to say that isn't important. It's very, very important, but it also reflects the use of aid um, to kind of play a more stopgap role than a long-term economic development role. And and the it's a kind of crazy when you look at the allocation of aid per child around the world. I'm going to show you a table of that uh, subsequently, but just to give you a sense of the scale of difference that a child, um, a Palestinian child, a Liberian child, uh, per child aid looks more like $80 per child, whereas the sort of median um, uh, respectively in uh, their two regions is more like $18 per child. So um, it's kind of a very interesting historical confluence of things that mean leads donors to have these sort of quote unquote donor darlings when it comes to education. For basic education, which kind of in a way is the focus for this course, the big donors are today the European Union. It has just become a very big donor. Germany um, has also gradually become a very, very big donor. The United Kingdom, the United States, the World Bank. Uh, we don't report on UNICEF and GPE because um, they don't report by level or in a disaggregated way. And um, about 80%, 60 percent of aid in low-income countries comes from these uh, donors. But the variation per country is really wide, as I've already said. Now, um, if you look at this table, um, I think uh, even me, when I when I was examining, I was sort of surprised. But if you look and you ask yourself what in the world order structures of national interest could be driving this. Um, is it need? Is it the need? Is it the level of, of um, gap in education or, or what could be driving it? You'll see right away that this is a very interesting picture. And here, this is the average receipt per year um, divided by the total school age population at primary and secondary. And what you can see is that the really big countries receiving um, the, the really big recipients of high levels of aid per capita are actually um, lower middle income or upper middle income countries. And that actually the um, uh, lower income countries are actually not the main recipients of aid. And who's the biggest uh, recipient? The biggest recipients are Moldova and Jordan. So this alone is, I mean, I think a stark reminder of the sort of geopolitical that there's an underlying geopolitical um, uh, motivation for foreign aid. Uh, I won't talk about this one. I just want to say next that another interesting feature is that each of the main donors to education spends on very different kinds of educational aid. 
And um, well, the Global Partnership for Education here doesn't report by level, so we, we just include the, the, the dollar amount. But if we look across them, what you'll see is that you have some donors like France and Germany, and in fact, all the, the G7 countries have a very high emphasis on secondary and higher, um, post-secondary or higher education, whereas um, a small number of donors, IDA from the World Bank, USA, um, the UK, uh, they, they tend to spend a little bit more on uh, basic or what we call general education, which usually means K to 12 um, education. Uh, ownership, as I mentioned, ownership, if we think about ownership of governments of the reforms being funded by aid, one measure of this is how much is channeled through national systems. Over time, um, we, we can see that um, this is the breakdown from 27 to 2019. So you can kind of see here that um, only 4% of this is in budget support. 9% is spent on experts and technical assistance, people like me or my organization. 17% um, is actually imputed student costs. That means the costs of uh, refugees um, or scholarships in uh, donor countries. Um, and what you can also see is that um, there's a big difference and multilaterals tend to, to less to tie aid to national delivery, um, their own national uh, donor delivery systems and, and use recipient governments. Um, this is another uh, two tables from a recent study from the Center for Global Development, which I think are really interesting. And what this study was, was a study of uh, policymakers in, I think, 36 uh, countries um, who receive uh, foreign aid. And here, uh, what they asked countries in two different ways, one through a sort of experimental question, a challenge question, and one just as a direct question, they asked them um, what their preferences are, like if they, if they, had, a, if they had a million dollars in aid, how would they spend it? And um, one of the things that um, this study pointed out was that uh, governments tended to want to spend foreign aid on TVET um, and much less, uh, and on access more generally like school construction, but that they were much less interested in foundational literacy. And this is, a, of course, um, the challenge that the overall course tries to, to address. How do we achieve changes in foundational literacy? If um, if that's our goal, then this gap between what donors think of as a priority or what RISE thinks of as a priority and what the preferences of governments are, it's a really big problem. And um, we'll talk, we can talk about that at the end. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about some other really interesting changes in the aid architecture. First of all, uh, especially um, in, in the period between 2000 and 2020, we saw this massive growth in private provision of education, both through sort of smaller mom and pop uh, 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 operations at the country level, but also through foreign aid. And today we have very strong uh, networks, uh, including um, global uh, franchises to, to provide uh, private uh, services and education. And I know this is an area where Faisal and Rabea can speak much more knowledgeably than I, in particular, of course, in Pakistan. Pakistan was sort of one of the model pilot countries for receiving foreign aid that would create um, a stronger and more regulated uh, a private, private provision a system of private provision of schooling. And then civil society has also blossomed. And we have things like the International Parliamentary Network for Education. We have the Global Campaign for Education. And most recently, the Abidjan Principles on the Right to Education, which are, in a way, a counteract to the um, some of the marketization or uh, privatization trends. At the same time, I, I want to make sure that we don't only cite um, sort of the more liberal end of society. We also have other very, very elaborate and very powerful uh, networks, faith-based networks, um, fundamentalist net networks that are part of our civil society and that um, have advanced very different views of, of, the, of what the right to education means, different interpretations. Uh, there's a lot of innovation 
or we could call it fragmentation in the architecture, um, the global partnership for education, the sort of newest multilateral kid on the block, which is a uh, the largest fund fully devoted to education. Um, it aim, it's kind of like a mini, um, a, a mini Gavi or a global fund for health. It's really small compared to those two, but its intention is to pool donor resources and to provide better quality aid to countries. Education cannot wait, the, an even newer um, mini multilateral that uh, focuses on education in emergencies. The Education Outcome Fund, um, a recent initiative that uh, focuses on uh, um, finance, using a PPP approach, so uh, leveraging private finance uh, to achieve deliverable outcomes in education, and then um, Education Commission itself that um, was the uh, out outcome of uh, Norwegian and other funders' efforts to raise education up the international agenda, which now itself is a sort of technical assistance organization in addition to convening uh, dialogue on this international education architecture. And I haven't said anything about non-Western donors, um, and I'm not going to have time to say anything about them, except that uh, with the rise of the G20 and um, the rise of middle income countries in world order, we've also seen almost every middle income country uh, announce and, and advance uh, their own bilateral aid programs. So uh, Brazil, India, Chile, they all, in, they all have international aid programs and China, of course, rapidly becoming the biggest of all the non-Western donors, including with its own uh, infrastructure and international development bank. Um, well, I want to just end by talking a little bit about some recent work on how we could fix the aid system. And um, Nick Burnett kind of launched this uh, debate in 2019. Um, he said, well, here's what you have to do. You have to get, get rid of UNESCO. It's useless. <laughs> um, that didn't sit very well with UNESCO. Um, create a UN education agency that's functional rather than politicized like UNESCO. Um, uh, uh, create sort of a knowledge and training so centers, uh, much fewer um, uh, mechanisms, so consolidate, like, for example, GPE should not, it, it, we shouldn't have education outcome funds in GPE, and um, education cannot wait, merge them all together to make a bigger block of funding, uh, make funding focused on key issues like books or skills or girls, and uh, create an effective interagency decision mechanism. And then of course he had um, some ideas about, well, what those, he thought those things were impossible to achieve. So here's some other things that could, could, could stand in their way, could, could stand in their place as sort of short-term and more practical. And among these, um, really just the agreement among organizations to create priority actions. So he was in a way saying, let's ditch the SDGs and let's really focus down on a smaller number of goals together. And um, in a way, the piece by Giran Bahari uh, from the Gates Foundation, which is, I want to just be clear, that is also a big found funder of the RISE program itself and of the foundational learning work being done by the World Bank and by others. Bihari's take is, in a way, narrowing down Nick Burnett's critique to an even, um, I think, a very uh, elegant and a smaller number of uh, areas of focus. Um, his argument is that it's not really about not having enough money. Of course, money is good, but, but it's about the poor focus and use of that money on effective solutions. Um, he, of course, advocates for making early grade literacy and numeracy in low income countries the foundational challenge. And he argues that if we could solve this as an international community, then we'd have the muscle to move on to the next level of problem, next, next order problems. He argues for three pillars of effective change in the delivery of international aid. So much more monitoring of performance and indeed introducing learning assessments as the main measure of that performance, more accountability for re results both at the country level and at the global level through um, the Global Partnership for Education primarily, and then more focus on what works to strengthen foundational literacy. 
lots of debate about this what works agenda indeed the rise um uh, leader uh, Lam Pritchett and, and the intellectual advisory group of RISE is very, very worried about the sort of what works agenda and much more interested in, as you have seen in your lectures, align the use of aid to create stronger alignment and less um, technical rational accountability for learning assessments and more use of data to allow adaptive change at the country level. Um, and in closing, um, uh, in a response to uh, the large number of uh, commentators of his paper, uh, Bahari had a postscript and, and he says he regrets in his initial piece that he did not focus more on um, the effective, effective, ability, uh, effective ways of closing national capabilities, uh, the gaps in national capabilities that in a way um, this in areas like evidence and knowledge utilization, the fact that so much knowledge and evidence is generated at the global level rather than uh, generated nationally and owned and used nationally is a fundamental problem. So that's Bahari's take. Um, I want to now give the Karen Mundy take on, on why is it that we haven't been able to um, improve aid to um, achieve uh, stronger educational uh, reforms uh, around the world. And I think first the first argument that I would make is that we actually have have had over the last 20 years two very, very different um, reform movements or conceptualizations about what educational reform looks like. One, on the one hand, um, and probably the more dominant and the more institutionally anchored, especially by organizations like the World Bank, is to really use incentives and rewards very effectively. Um, uh, this uh, emphasis on stronger standards and test-based accountability that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And then uh, on the other hand, we've had a much lighter um, reform agenda that is much more focused on creating a culture of high aspirations for children, funding education properly, working with teachers and, and creating a more professionalized teaching workforce, um, and then really co-construction of professional norms and standards. So very different reform agendas to me, I think uh, tackling the gap between these reform agendas and, and empowering local actors, especially teachers and civil society organizations to be the ambassadors for reform is very important. I'm not convinced that the aid uh, regime as currently structured really pays enough attention to the need for that kind of national level engagement and ownership. Um, I also, um, I'm, I think we're going to hear if we read international development uh, uh, products we're, from different agencies, we're, we're going to hear over and over again that what we've got to have is the use of evidence. If we use evidence better, suddenly things will go well. I think that's a little naive and in a way, um, looking at educational reform across uh, even high performing and very wealthy systems like my own uh, in Ontario, Canada. I think uh, what we see is that this use, that evidence is usually um, not evidence-based policy processes, but policy-based evidence. So people are using evidence to steer specific reforms rather than to stand back and really question which kind of reform agenda uh, works. Um, I describe it as high modernism, this notion that if you have a rational technical set of evidence, suddenly the solutions suddenly fall out before you. Um, and I, I um, hearken back to some of the really beautiful early literature on international aid regime um, by Ferguson, in which he pointed out that the aid regime is surprisingly anti-political. It is, in fact, he called it an anti-politics machine. That is, we try to rationalize and create um, a buffer between ourselves and politics. Inevitably, that's impossible, but we try to do that and we use evidence-based policy as the, the kind of screen or the buffer between ourselves and the deeper citizen engagement, the deeper engagement of professionals in self-determination that really will lead to sustainable change. That's my own take. And then just finally, um, I think that the um, prescription that Giran sets out has much to uh, recommend it, but I am very worried about the fact that it's been framed, 
um, poorly that we have created an association between test-based accountability and foundational learning that isn't one that can be broadly embraced by teachers as professionals, that we've too narrowly defined what learning is and in a way that can never make um, countries uh, feel happy. No, no matter how lacking in resources a country is, the notion that all their kids need to learn is literacy is never going to go over well. Uh, we've failed to bring a civil society um, anchor into the narrative about foundational learning. We've missed out this chance to engage teachers and their organizations. These are not just mechanisms. They aren't groups to incentivize. They're actually agents of development themselves. Uh, we've really, really, really missed the boat, in my opinion, in linking this foundational learning agenda to uh, what does that mean for a future of prosperity peace and sustainability. And in particular, um, by thinking, by creating um, a competition between access and between higher education, especially youth skills and foundational learning, we've actually um, weakened the, the more important um, opportunity to create stronger, um, a, a stronger understanding of how education systems work to meet educational needs across the lifespan. Um, uh, and finally, you know, I just, I guess myself think that the foundational learning agenda um, sort of misses a chance to think about the world in realist terms, which is important if it wants to, strategic, to see, succeed strategically. So I'm going to end there. Those are my critiques. And then maybe I should just say at the end, of course, I believe that the right to, uh, to, to basic literacy is a foundational human right. And I often say to my own students that one cannot imagine anything, any kind of learning that is worse than the learning that happens when you go to school and you don't learn literacy. That is, we sometimes think of this as the hidden curriculum that a child who sits in a classroom for many years and doesn't learn to read learns that they can't learn. And that's uh, probably the worst affront to human rights I can think of. So I think the foundational learning agenda is very important, but in a way I question the framing. Okay, I'm going to end there and probably we're at time. So I'm very sorry that I have uh, over, overrun the time frame and maybe not left enough time for questions, but I hope we'll rejoin with this simulation exercise later on in the month and have a chance to do that, to do that larger conversation. Yes, absolutely, Karen. Thank you so much. Both of these pieces, I think, brought together so many aspects of this topic. And as I said, it was so complex, but to pull it together um, in this way is just absolutely very insightful. Uh, Parisa, would you like to uh, say something? Any comments that you might have? You know, um, I don't know if there's time to have uh, one or two questions, Karen, uh, if students have anything or up to you. Karen, would you have a couple of minutes? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. So I'm okay. really happy to respond. And I, I'm actually, sorry, I'm, I'm actually looking at the comments and most of them are comments, not questions. Um, That's true. Exactly. And you covered sort of, I think, how donors are functioning in areas of conflict and how um, aid, uh, you know, can be provided. Um, you know, I, it, somebody it, asked about Afghanistan and, yeah. you know, because... IIP, we, we had worked in Afghanistan for many years, uh, strengthening the capability of the Ministry of Education to better plan and manage the system, uh, helping to create a national civil service training institute um, to strengthen um, subnational sort of capacities. And of course, all of that um, was blown sky high. But from my understanding now is that all aid to education in Afghanistan is now being delivered through non-governmental organizations, both national and international organizations, so that there's, there's really no direct engagement with government. Now, that's not actually uncommon in um, conflict or um, low, really, really um, high, highly disruptive societies. And sometimes it, 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 it has a, so hard to say this, but like a silver lining. Why do I say that? 
it actually really strengthens um, local capability to manage and organize, to work through non-governmental actors. They tend to focus less on centralized national mechanisms for management and more localized ones. So you can see, I mean, an organization like BRAC, which is doing a lot of the work in, in a lot of, in some regions in Afghanistan, has been very, very, done a wonderful job to really build that subnational level of capability. So that's that's what's happening in Afghanistan. Of course, we heard the news yesterday about um, prohibitions for girls at the secondary level. So there's lots going lots going wrong, and it's a it's a really I think for the average Afghani girl, it's a pretty terrifying time educationally, and life chances um, for everybody in Afghanistan are are very fragile. Even to meet basic needs is becoming very hard, but. Aid is still flowing, but it's flowing through these different routes. And if I may ask, um, so since others don't have a question, just a reflection. So in the international aid architecture, you've talked a lot about the, um, both the architecture and delivery. What role does ideas and um, uh, technical support sort of play? Mm -hmm. And what's the dynamic for that flow back and, back and forth? Yeah. I, I think for a very long time, the, the, the sort of gradual buildup of an international network of quote unquote experts on education um, has been evolving and where the, that expertise is anchored shifted over time. So we initially would have seen it sitting mainly in bilateral organizations, but probably from the 1990s, the anchor, intellectual anchor um, has sat, at, sat in, the, in the World Bank. Um, this is why we see this sort of lifelong um, debate between academics who work in comparative education and the World Bank. I mean, it's our favorite organization to kick. Um, and some have argued over time that there's something pathological about the tight relationship between being a funder and the provider of reform ideas. And I think that has a lot of warrant. But at the same time, it would probably be a bit naive to imagine that we're going to decouple those things completely. Um, now, who, who, who countervails to the World Bank's? Often, remember the bank, being a bank, whose main purpose is to move out money, it comes up with um, ideas and then it kind of shoves them down countries' throats, but not, not really because of any intention, but because it needs like a boilerplate that it can use to manage its to shape and design its actual operations. Um, so I think that the countervail for, for this, for the bank's work really has come from outside of international institutions and from the academic world. That's why having great institutions like LUMS develop a very strong policy role and being able to speak to the bank more richly about local contexts and understanding that International organizations almost by definition use these very simplified approaches to technical assistance that are usually driven by northern expertise, not very much inclusive of, um, I mean, for sure they'll use local consultants, but they very rarely um, endow local institutions or organizations or universities with the funds to allow a, a more sustainable intellectual ecosystem. So that's how I see it. Um, and of course, uh, spoken from somebody who's sitting in a technical agency, like a, a small agency that, but our goal um, isn't to, to, to uh, create global level uh, capacity. It's to actually strengthen national capacity by working in partnership with local ministries and local uh, intellectual partners to improve the ecosystem of technical assistance so that there's a much thicker um, uh, national and regional um, uh, approach to to thinking about education reform. To you know, not I don't, I'm not a big fan of the global what works agenda setting kind of exercise. I'm much more interested in how to strengthen national capabilities to use, of course, global data, but then really think through carefully whether that local those those global ideas really make sense in local context. Uh, thank you so much for your talk today. It was very insightful. Um, uh, 
uh, you said something about um, health getting more aid than education. So I was just wondering if that is because um, uh, you can see quicker results when it comes to health as opposed to education, or is there another reason? So if I were a realist, I would tell you that it's much easier to think about health as an indivisibility and pandemics spill over borders much more quickly than education emergencies. Yeah? So in a way, one might say that there's a, a stronger um, self-interest in the health domain than in the education domain. And remember that education is very tightly guarded as an area of national sovereignty, both by um, donors and by developing countries. And that's for a good reason, because of its cultural impact, its, its, its role in winning hearts and minds and loyalties. So, you know, it, it tends to be used for these geopolitical purposes more elaborately because of that hearts and minds role. That's my, my theory. Now, others would argue that it's also because, you know, you can, you can create a vaccine and you can show the result very quickly of that vaccine or a pill or a, another treatment, you know, these kind of things. But actually, when you really look at um, health systems, health systems are as complex as education systems because they're very elaborate delivery mechanisms. So maybe to say that health has achieved a lot, it's achieved a lot, especially in delivery of these more quick fixes um, you know, the best buys in health are all short term treatments. And whenever health, the health sector thinks about systems, it gets into the same problems and challenges that education has in terms of how do you deliver something through these very complex, um, not only bureau bureaucratically complex, but organizationally complex, because there's a lot of private providers um, in most health systems. Now, is aid to education ever going to achieve that in health? I don't think so because the historical precedent was set and now we have uh, conflict, uh, health, climate, and we're about to have, I think, a world economic uh, crisis. <laughs> so all of these things will pull money out of um, a sector like education. I'm seeing it every day um, sitting here in, 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 in the, at the heart of the UN. So I don't think so. Um, the flip side is that when you look at public sector budgets, education tends to get more than health. That's evening out a little bit. So uh, overall, the health global architecture is stronger, the education weaker, the education national uh, financing pool is stronger, and health is weaker. So that some people might think that's the right, the education is the beneficiary of that, that having more domestic funding is far more important than global funding. In, in for sectors like health and education. So two ways of thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture today. This was fantastic. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.